This particular session is called, This is Changing Driver Behavior Through Coaching. We have Dennis Dellinger, he's the president of Cargo Transporters Incorporated. We have Gary Johnson, director of safety. And Clay Burgess, he's the vice president of safety and human resources with J&R Chicago Trucking Incorporated. First, a little bit about uh, legs. And it is probably the number one question we always get is how do you say it? It's legs. It's uh, really it's the last part of analytics, which really is, that's what we talked as a company is that we're about the data management, it's about data. Not only uh, the video technology and now with the introduction and the acquisition of rare compliance services, it really is a company that addresses uh, behaviors overall, but doing it through analytical power. So, with that, Effectively coaching with technology. Um, I just recently have only, I guess a year now, been with Linux. The, the previous 30 plus years of my life was in the trucking industry. That's all I've done is safety throughout, starting way back in the car hauliers, what we call the parking lots back then, uh, all the way through you know, air, uh, transportation, cargo, uh, over dimensional, you name it. The, I've sort of had the experience. And I guess it really comes down to you know, how do we effectively coach? And as many of you remember, it's how do you get to those behaviors? How do you change and effectively change the behaviors to be successful? Well, that really takes a combined effort. And, you know, I have been to Lombardi up there. Of course, I just recently moved to Green Bay, being from Minnesota. And I like Green Bay. You can imagine the struggles of living in Green Bay right now. But, um, but I think you said it the, the best. It takes combined efforts. You know, we focus so much on the driver, the professional driver, but we realize that the back office and the support staff is really what helps those athletes. And then those athletes, what I mean is the professional driver. So it takes everybody <coughs> working together as a team to address those behaviors needed. So at the end of the day, you know, you're impacting, what we say is not only your culture, but that ultimate value of life. Another uh, quote that I always like uh, when I throw it up there is about how do we do that? Well, sometimes we do it with the kick and prod method uh, when it came to uh, counseling, but really, you know, this quote I think says the best is that you, you get the best efforts not by lighting a fire, you know, beneath them, but lighting the fire with them. Getting the, everybody to understand the value that they have in the organization, what the end result really <coughs> means. And as to be it, what I'd say again, an effective team. That's the key. So, moving on, technology. I've talked about technology and the changes, and how does that how does that play out when it comes to coaching nowadays? Uh, with the introduction of technology, we have more data that comes into us. You know, mountains of data that you could utilize one way or another. Predictive analytics. You know, how, what data do you use for predictive? At the end of the day, you still have to take the data, sit down with the individual, and, and come to a conclusion of what behaviors need to be identified. So this is an example, and you see it moving across the toggle on top. What I'd say is this is the technology adopted like your hard breaking. You know, when that came out, us as uh, individuals in the, in the back office, we had to try to decipher it. What do we do with these events? What, what do you do with this data? A lot of times you get an event like this that shows a hard break in the center of the screen. So you'd sit down or that driver would call you and, and the car cut me off. Or the car came up too fast, you know, they all stop, stop, stop suddenly and I had to break. That's the reason. So you, you go through that discussion with them briefly, try to get as much detail out of them as you can. Well, then comes along, I'd say, the next part of the technology, which is video technology. So this is an outside view. Here you see the same, the heartbreaking event up on top, and in the bottom you see uh, driving along, and obviously the cars come to the stop. So it, it goes back to the start, you know, the statement that the driver had originally, and that is, you know, I had to make an evasive maneuver because, you know, all of a sudden these cars stop. Then you're gonna sit down and talk to them again. But then comes along the inside. Now we have technology that actually puts you in the cab along with all those other factors. So now when you get the inside lens and you get the whole picture, your, your technology nowadays puts you in the cab with that driver. He's distracted, he's texting and driving. As you know, is what is one of the top distractions for causing crashes, to keep your eyes out that road. 
So you see through the, the sections here of technology of really how it is adopted into addressing with the drivers, but then to the point of you have technology that actually puts you in the cab and gets the real story, gets the real behavior. So modifying the behaviors through the coaching. Heinrich uh, had the study out that obviously <coughs> 300 non uh, dam adversity incidents can lead to that one major. And it really comes down to how you get ahead of those behaviors before they end up as a major crash. And in the past, you know, we were so reactionary in the ways that we were coaching with the lack of technology. But today, with the technology, it puts us in so we can really be proactive. <coughs> and we can get in that gap quicker to those individuals and really address the behaviors that ultimately, which we are trying to prevent, uh, is that ultimate fail. So what other benefits does the technology bring us? Well, we do know that with technology, especially uh, technology that I'm you know, now a part of, is that the more it is in introduced into the fleets, the bigger impact it has. And this is an internal study of our own that we have experienced, obviously, with video technology and the equipment. The bottom section is percent of fleets that are actually installed. So if you have 100% with the technology, the greater impact it has in what we consider as the DOT crashes, you know, the 84%. So technology does help with addressing these behaviors. And obviously the more technology, and, and of course the other factor in here is coaching, it, it has those impacts. Not to mention, you know, things as, as turnovers, orientation, uh, <coughs> attention, uh, but ultimately also your CSA score. You know, this is a line of uh, factors that you can address with the unsafe behaviors that really are ultimately the roadside experiences. So it does have a combined impact overall. But like I said, those others are the term of, uh, retention, uh, orientation process, things like that. But it all comes down to that ultimate is the coaching. And that's what you're going to hear from the two speakers uh, coming up right behind me, is how do you effectively coach? You can have coaching sessions, but how do you effectively coach? And the key, I think, with any uh, great practice, you know, good practice is, is that how do you measure that effectiveness? Are you holding the coaches accountable? Because you still need that individual. Many in our fleets that we're accustomed to, it could be the operation, the fleet manager, it's not always safe, but can they have those discussions, those tough discussions? And once they have the discussions, are they making the impact? And are you able to track that impact? And this is just an example of a dashboard that we utilize that really addresses, are you being effective with the coaching process? So with that, I'm going to have Dennis come up. Basically who we are, um, we operate in the 48 continental United States, uh, mainly east of the Rockies. Uh, we operate uh, 484 power units, uh, 525 drivers, about 1,600 trailers privately held, uh, a little over 100 million in revenues, and uh, exceeded 55 million uh, miles last year. We have association with TCA, ATA, um, Reeds Across America, North Carolina Trucking Association, <laughs> and very involved in all those associations. You know, we're a company that um, pretty much um, our culture has been safe in family, and uh, we've deployed uh, beside collision avoidance, uh, the mobile communications. We use all the facets you see on the right, lane guidance, electronic uh, stability <coughs> control, collision warning, um, a lot of the technologies that we've got listed there. But basically, you know, we felt like um, to get to the next level, uh, to train our drivers, um, to, to be able to show them you know, what they're doing, uh, it was only natural that we install the event recorders. Upon review uh, and, and deployment of 30, uh, we realized we couldn't get them in quick enough. Um, it, it was, again, that progressive step to ensure that we uh, safeguarded our culture of, of safety and family. And you know, sometimes people think those two uh, issues conflict, but you know, really, everyone's going to take care of their family. And, and we, we feel like taking care of their family uh, internally, family externally, and, and the motoring public uh, is our responsibility as a carrier. 
This is one of the reasons we chose to, to go with the cameras in our uh, early days. Had that USA not moved uh, over, had hit its brakes hard, uh, we were traveling, I think, at the time at 62 miles, maybe 63 miles an hour, we would have rear-ended it. Uh, the lane guidance went off, probably kept us from hitting the swift truck in the back. We never looked to the left when we jerked it over into the left lane. And then we ran off the road, had the road been soft, that we potentially could have had an overturned trailer. Um, this is a driver. Um, it was interesting because that individual came up to me earlier and said, you know, maybe you could have kept this driver. Uh, it's obvious that he has sleep apnea, but there was, there was more to the story. This driver was already on safety probation for an accident that occurred less than five weeks earlier. And um, safety did not have the details. Again, we didn't have the cameras. We didn't know what happened. We just based it on what information he shared with us, which absolutely uh, was incorrect as, as we looked at it later. So. Again, we felt uh, with, with this one, it was definitely a need. Uh, some people aren't coachable, and, and Clay had talked a lot about coaching. Gary talked about coaching. Um, so sometimes you have to take immediate action, and, and basically we terminated this driver. Um, it was never our intent. He was the first one that we actually termed based on video events, but this guy, after having the accident previous, uh, would not have been defendable. You know, driver distractions, this is another one. Uh, we, we've worked uh, to coach and, and to um, improve upon safety. This driver here was listening to a video on tape, and uh, I always say I'm not a, I do not condone even hands-free, but definitely, you know, not a cell phone, but even worse than cell phone is a, a book on tape. And actually, that's what happens with this guy. And I don't think we can see the speed here. Maybe we can, but I think he was doing about 52 or 53 when he went through the intersection. When he was brought in to be coached, he didn't know he ran through this intersection. Had no idea. We, we had a, um, we had a, in our um, recruiting department, we had a library of books on tape. Uh, needless to say, they were eliminated afterwards. Uh, they, they don't exist. Uh, but that's, you know, one of the things that we were, we were faced with there. Kind of how we proceeded, and, and, and an important thing, um, as far as training drivers, we did a, our demo beginning May of 11. Um, we were up to 32 units, in, uh, or added actually 32 units in, in August, another 38 units in November, uh, added 10 uh, in February. We added 15 more in March of 12, and basically between um, March, uh, somewhere in that time frame to September, we added 325 units to have us fully deployed at 450 units at that time. We saw that we were having more accidents in the trucks that we weren't deployed. There was an awareness at, at the drivers that we were coaching with, that we were working with. We weren't seeing accidents in those trucks uh, at that particular time and um, decided to, to do a rapid installment there, a rapid deployment there. Um, between uh, March and, and September. You know, we had goals um, as far as doing installation with uh, fraudulent claims, um, you know, making a better driver, uh, preventing those situations before they occur, and then also taking our safety program to the higher, a higher level. And, and this one here is a situation where um, basically, uh, the young lady comes in front of us, her mother came to the scene of the accident, wanted a trooper to write us a ticket, uh, and um, basically we told the driver, or actually the trooper, we had uh, the event recorders in a truck, and, and he took the word of the driver, never even saw the event, but uh, did write the ticket for uh, the young lady. As you notice, and that's instead of stopping us and kind of going through it multiple times, the driver could not move to the left. If you notice that car that came up on the left side, so did not have the ability to move to the left. Um, so the only thing that that driver could have done was maintain his lane and, and slow down his speed. But again, it's a responsibility of that driver merging onto the highway to adjust their speed to be able to get on. Sometimes um, 
I, I think our society today thinks it's a responsibility of that driver that's on the main road to, to yield for you coming on. But for those of us that uh, you know, maybe have a little bit of age on us, if, if we think back, there were always yield signs down at the bottom of the, the ramps. And, and there may be some states that there still are, but uh, you don't see them much anymore. But this, this was an exoneration that actually helped us to sell to the, our other drivers. Um, this was a merging axe I'm getting ready to show here. Uh, the next day, the driver was in a neck brace and had secured an attorney. We actually uh, sent the footage to the attorney. Um, the, the attorney dropped the client. We had to wait until the statute of limitations to make sure that the client didn't pick up another attorney. But uh, this is one that uh, probably saved us a lot of dollars. It's always important to know if, if your driver maintained his or her lane, um, and that's that's one of the easiest things um, for us to see. You know who's at fault, and uh, definitely that's something that we try to train. We try to, to coach our drivers um, to stay in a lane. And we use examples like this. Had our driver moved to any direction, then it could have caused some controversy. So you know when these things happen, if they stay in that particular lane. Um, we're going to come out to the best. You know, we want to develop a better driver through our coaching. Um, that following distance is always important, and that's probably one of the, the biggest coaching events that we have is following too close. Um, a lot of drivers um, like to say, if I leave too much space in front of me, then you know, the cars are going to come in. But by leaving that space and, and working and coaching, I, I've got, a, I think, one or two here quickly that um, will show you where that driver left the space and was able to avoid contact. <laughs> then the next one here is very similar. I always tell on this one, uh, this driver did stop afterwards. Uh, he didn't keep on going to make sure that the driver in this vehicle was okay. The thing that you always wonder when you see these, what would have happened had we made contact with that vehicle? Would, would someone came out and, and said um, that you may, you hit it first, you spun it out? Um, would there be somebody that drove up and said, well, I witnessed it and the, and the, the truck hit them uh, because they didn't see the vehicle run off the road to the left? There are so many variables here. And I, again, working with the drivers, coaching the drivers at following distance, being alert, being attentive um, helps, and, and, and sometimes I think the, there's maybe angels out there helping them as well, but uh, th this is one here. Um, you know, we, we kind of felt like taking our, our safety to a higher level, and, and we found out that we had a lot of drivers not wearing their seat belts, and that was our biggest campaign was getting our drivers to wear seat belts after our beta test. And, there was a study that came out, again, I apologize for not knowing uh, who actually released the study, but it was told that one in six commercial drivers do not wear their seat belts. And, and trust me, if you're not uh, uh, viewing in the camera, you have that going on right now because we, we found that we did. Today we feel like that we're probably, I'd say at least 98 percent, but I'd say probably before, uh, going with the event recorders, we might have been as in the low 80s possibly even. The seat belt saved this driver's life. <coughs> I, I, I always tell this windshield, um, as in the next one probably I'm going to show, ended up in the woods. Uh, the truck actually climbed up a tree because it went down a ravine, but kind of climbed a tree and caught fire and burned to the firewall. So, Fortunately, it actually threw the windshield out because the camera then was uh, intact and we were able to download it and, and get this information, which was actually good because 
Long story behind this one, there were, there were conflicting stories as to what happened. Uh, first of all, uh, I was told that we ran the vehicle, then I was told the vehicle did a U-turn in front of us, but you can clearly see it came from the road on the, the left. Um, actually, the story was that this young lady just came out of a crack house, so uh, I don't know whether she was, but, but had to be, um, uh, I think, medevaced out, uh, had some severe injuries, but uh, it was something we really never had to deal with because the liability was, was assumed that she was the only vehicle, or actually the only uh, person in the vehicle. This is actually um, a pedestrian situation where, again, we, we kind of feel like maybe some of our training, our coaching, uh, had this driver um, on his, I guess, heightened alert. Uh, probably a situation we had a couple years ago in, in a truck stop. We tried to make people more aware <coughs> to be uh, cognitive of their um, surroundings. And I know you, you kind of look at it and, and think, you know, kind of a, a low speed there in, in that pedestrian. But again, one of our biggest claims um, in the last couple of years occurred in a truck stop with a pedestrian. This is another one here. Um, again, um, the heightened awareness of uh, the seat belt, um, very similar to one we showed earlier. They actually happened within six weeks of one another. That truck overturns, the windshield's out in the field, out in, um, again, had to be retrieved and, and downloaded. Uh, as I said, very similar to the one that, this actually was the first one, the other one occurred six weeks later. But very fortunate, both these individuals that I showed you, um, neither one of them had, neither one of them lost work. Neither one of them had any downtime as far as maybe, you know, maybe a day, um, but not a not a long term uh, that it resulted in any type of work comp claim. This the individual in the car. Um, the first call we got, the, we thought we had a fatality. Um, actually, the car crushed all the way to the firewall, but the, the the cab or not the cab, but the interior of the car stayed intact. And the guy actually walked out of it. Uh, he did admit to the fact that he had a cell phone that dropped into the floorboard of the right-hand side and he was reaching to get it. And, and you know, kind of one of those situations where you think, what, what if that person would have been killed in that accident uh, with no skid marks and, and some of the things that were going on? Um, this here could have been priceless. Fortunately, we didn't have to use it, but it could have been priceless. Going back to the, the, the training side, the coaching side, um, <coughs> You know, we, we look at the, the fact here, our CSA violations in 11, we had four seat belts, and in 14, we didn't have any seat belt violations, so um, that's a pretty strong improvement there. Our speeding, um, you know, we went from 16 to 11. It, that's one that, that still that we need to work on, and probably our two biggest ones that we work on coaching is the following distance I mentioned earlier, then speeding would follow right behind that. And whenever we think of speeding, just to kind of make everyone aware, because I was in the discussion uh, at some point over the last several days, but our trucks are at 63. And I'm not talking about somebody running um, 70 miles or 75 miles or 80 miles an hour on the interstate. Typically, the speeding takes place in those 35 mile an hour zones, the 45s. Um, I don't know that we have any CSA violations that occurred on the interstate. Most of them are secondary. Uh, roads where they're happening. So again, that, that's one that we continue to coach on. Uh, we kind of feel like our coaching has been effective. Uh, last year, for the entire calendar year, we had 41 of our drivers that did not have one coachable event the entire year. And you know, you can focus on the coaching side and have an, an improvements, and, and we have seen improvements with our coaches, but, but the key thing if we can increase that number from 41 to 50 some next year or 60 some or 70 some, those are people you're not spending time coaching. And, and that's, you know, we, we see value in it and, and we're going to improve and have a better driver um, because of the uh, lytics cameras there. You know, in conclusion, 
we feel like we are better. We feel like we are safe. We have room for improvement. Uh, you know, but it's, but it's our um, expectations that, you know, we, we take care of our driver staff and, and, and relative to both highway workplace and, and workplace safety or highway safety and workplace safety. My key thing is the cameras of truth. Uh, people look at different things. Had we had witnesses to either or any of these clips that I showed you earlier, uh, their view would have been different in, in so many ways. Um, Clay will show you as, as he goes through some of his slides, you know, he'll break them down in seconds or, or maybe even quarter seconds and allow you to see different things that you would not see just playing the, the thing through for 12 seconds or the person seeing it when it takes place. But it is the truth and, and so it is our responsibility to use a tool to better train our driver <laughs> staff and, and, and really to help them out when they're wrongly accused because uh, I think the statistics are out that normally uh, uh, out of every 10 accidents, probably six or seven are the fault of, of the, um, the motoring public. Uh, I think we're responsible for probably 30 to 40 percent at the most or a high 30. But, you know, we need to protect them uh, whenever they're wrongly accused. But the biggest thing we use it for also, from my perspective, is settling those liability claims. Um, you know, if, if we're uh, at fault, then we want to get out in front of it and, and settle it quickly. Uh, we're not afraid to admit the law enforcement or um, the other insurance parties that we are at fault. Um, but, you know, we want to be able to deal with it fairly when, when we're liable uh, and, and take our responsibility there. Thank you. What's the difference between a professional athlete and a professional driver? There isn't one, right? How many of us are in trucking that's in here today? Right? How many of us are safety guys or owners? Okay, or in risk management, something like that. Okay. We watch football, and what happens to Peyton Manning after three outs? So three downs and out, they're punting the football. What would he do? You guys watch it on TV, or we watch it every day on ESPN, NBC Sports. He walks over to the sideline, and he sits down, and he grabs his iPad, just like you said today, and he watches all of the plays that he just ran. He finds out where the mistakes are at, and he fixes them. He goes, I'm not going to make that same mistake again. And that's how the, the NFL, Major League Baseball, and all of these other athletic events and sporting events have gotten so much better through time, is with video technology. I'm a coach, and I can't see my players play. How am I supposed to help them improve? I can't do it without seeing them perform. And video technology gives us that ability. We're looking at that driver and we're seeing what he's doing during that critical event. So we're gonna play the slide here, we're gonna watch the video and how that driver performed. And this normal everyday performance of the, of, of the uh, athletes, I'm gonna say, okay? Before we had video technology, you know, the driver would have called in and said I was involved in an accident, a collision. We would have asked what would have happened. He said, I wouldn't have been making a button hook turn. I know I'd make a button hook turn. I've been driving for 20 years. I was making a button hook turn and this car wasn't paying attention and squeezed up the right side of it. Okay? And that's what the report was. We asked him to download the video. Of course, you could see that he's turning into our terminal, right? So we get the video, pull them right on in, we review it real quick, and we're able to see what the actual re what actually happened, right? Let's play it again here real quick, and if you don't mind, we'll play a couple seconds and then freeze it here for it. There we go, let's freeze. What lane is he set up in? The center turn lane all day long, right? And then, and then, no. and then right? And then when he starts approaching and making the turn, the button hook turn, he swings out into the oncoming lane of track. So how easy was it for that car to squeeze up the side of it? It wasn't squeezing at all, right? But unfortunately, we're unique in the industry. We are the only profession that deals with non-professionals. It's an awesome coaching tool for us to be able to see this, break it on down, and then say, look, I understand you're in the profession for 20 years. You're a great driver. I'm not telling you you're not a bad driver. But you know what? If you were a baseball player, you would be in a bad in slump right now because your elbow is dropped. You need to get your elbow back up. So in this particular case right here, he's lazy, right? And he's not setting up a proper button on the turn. 
right? He's just gradually moving on over into that lane and probably tra traveling hundreds of feet in the center turn lane just to make it easy to turn into the turn. Where, is it, where are his eyes looking at? Does he ever look in his mirror? No. He's looking through the turn, which is great. We want him to look through the turn, right? But somewhere in between this turning maneuver, we have to be able to look in that convex mirror and that side mirror. Be able to look and see who's coming up beside me. Am I properly blocking my inside lane? Is my trailer going to dog, tra dog trail correctly and hit something or not hit something, right? So we're able to talk to him a little bit more on the Smith System Defensive Driving Principles and say, okay, what principle are we missing today? And these are the principles we're going to focus on. X, Y, Z. These are the three things you need to work on. 